All right, if we can get all of our wonderful live in-person guests to filter in, and I'm gonna ask everybody as well to not be shy and come as close to the front as you can so that as, as others that are out there parking their cars or shaking off the rain uh, need to sneak in a little late, they can come in around the back and, uh, and not obscure your view. Wonderful, we'll get started here in about three minutes. If we can get everybody to take your seats, get ready, we'll get this show on the road. John, that includes you. <laughs> Hello. Everybody take a seat, please. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. All right. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, many thanks to everybody who's here today, and in addition to everybody that's present here live in person, we do still have virtual crowds through Zoom. So uh, thanks for everybody who's watching on Zoom as well. I've been asked a number of times over the last month or so, why a strategic plan? Well, it's simple. In the words of my fellow AED board member, Dale Decker, the timing for it is perfect. <laughs> yeah, I can't read that. And I got glasses on. Uh, the world as we know it has changed. The cruciality of the supply chain, redundancy has been exposed and businesses in all sectors have been impacted um, and have had to innovate and rapidly pivot to operate during the pandemic. The importance of talent as a driver in site selection is at an all time high leading nearly all business location decisions. And this won't change anytime soon, if ever. Over the next five years, 138 million square meters, for those of you in America, that's almost 1.5 billion square feet of additional e-commerce dedicated logistics space will be required worldwide to support business according to uh, CBRE. Yet, we are still at the top of the list nationally in our unemployment rate. 
but there are positive uh, indicators abound. According to a recent survey of consultant, consultants by the Site Selectors Guild, sustainability and green energy as site selection factors are also increasing among nearly all industries as companies strive for reduced carbon compliance and regulatory uh, carbon footprints and regulatory compliance. Those are areas in which New Mexico excels. And our region is garnering investment and interest like never before with opportunity inquiries far exceeding those seen in 2019, which was a record year for AED. Finally, we have welcomed new leadership to the organization, bringing on Danielle, making it a perfect time to reevaluate our efforts and areas of focus and deliver a transparent, data-driven and performance-based uh, plan. The time is ours to become proactive versus reactive and execute from a collaborative and regional lens. We absolutely could not have done this without our sponsors who made this strategy possible. Bernalillo County, the City of Albuquerque, New Mexico Gas Company, Public, Co Public Service Company of New Mexico, Bradbury Stam Construction and KPMG, and also with additional support from Garden Schwartz Realty, Century Sign Builders, Decker Parrott Sabatini, Fidelity Investments, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, and Caroline Garcia. Our strategic plan task force members served as thought leaders, guideposts, and also critical reviewers throughout this process, all while we developed the plan. Many thanks to all who served and donated their time, and in particular, their brain power. I would like to take a brief moment to recognize the large number of dignitaries and officials either in the physical audience or joining us virtually. Torrance County Manager, Janice Barella, Bernalillo County District 4 Commissioner, Walt Benson, District 20 Representative, Meredith Dixon, Sandoval County Commission President, David Heil, Sandoval County Manager, Wayne Johnson, District 20 Senator, Martin Hickey, Sandoval County Commissioner, Michael Meek, APS Board Members, Peggy Mueller aragon Barbara Peterson, Candelaria Patterson, and Board President David Piercy, Bernalillo County Manager Julie Morgus Baca, Sandoval County Commissioner Catherine Brook, and some great partners in the community, such as Tanya Armenta, President and CEO of Visit Albuquerque, Deborah Brightfield, New Mexico Tech Council, Monica Sandoval Johnson, and Maggie Werner Washburn with STEM Boomerang, and Randy Trask with the New Mexico Trade Alliance. And so many, many additional members of the AED board, public sector officials, and economic development leaders. In fact, if time permitted, there is no one in the audience that does not deserve recognition. So thank you all for being with us today. And now to set the stage a bit more and, and introduce our first round of guest speakers is our AED president, Danielle Casey. All right, and, and one more to add to the list is Sanibal County Manager Wayne Johnson, who's actually here in the flesh. So thank you for being here. All right, well, let's get this one, hello. All right, well, thank you very much, Joe. Thanks for everybody here today. Again, as I have told so many of you, since I arrived in Albuquerque at the very end of October, my furniture got delivered on Halloween, so I did not give out candy. I was slicing boxes open. Um, I was still very much in uh, under full COVID stay at home orders at that time. Uh, since then, I've been highly focused on taking advantage of that situation, uh, you know, making uh, lemonade out of lemons and, uh, and turning that time into focusing on laying out a long term plan for our future success and uh, as a region. So in addition to the many reasons why we need a strategic plan, which Joe already shared, I'm going to add that time is truly of the essence so we can align our resources and focus uh, really in the most highly advantageous areas to ensure that we do not continue to find our region left behind. You're gonna hear some challenging figures today uh, and you're gonna see them in the strategic plan executive summary before you or that you can find online uh, later if you're watching via Zoom. But this strategy is absolutely not about finding or identifying fault in our efforts or in any way feeling less than. It is about solutions. For this process, 
we have worked to ensure that we garnered as much input as possible from AED leadership, from members in the community, from public sector partners, private, nonprofit institutions, and other folks around our great region. We, have ten, we, have, we actually had 10 different significant touch points through meetings, roundtables, uh, events and programs uh, to make sure that we talk to people throughout this entire process and, and also engaged with stakeholders and, uh, and really continue to promote the program and the process regionally. We've had some great op-eds, material, and I don't think I've, I've been on a podium virtual or otherwise. And by the way, now that we're going to have more events, I'm going to have to buy more colorful suits. So, um, <laughs> but, but, but really, you know, every time I've had the chance on a podium to talk about the, the fact that we're doing this great work I have. So um, by, by virtue of everyone being here today online and in person, you've heard it. So that's uh, really wonderful and I'm tremendously thankful. The strategy is not simply a list of the most impactful things we think we can do to affect the economy and AED's role in this work. It is also a guidepost for what AED itself as an organization must do to deliver on the strategy. Uh, many of you have heard me say this, as we know the best laid plans are completely useless uh, without the right sort resources to execute. And, uh, and hopefully you don't, and I have no intention of bringing a proverbial knife to a gunfight. So those are things they're gonna be working on as well. Helping us combine these critical elements uh, understanding the community's desires and perceptions, as well as analyze, analyzing our competitiveness and our best opportunities in a data-driven manner. And I think that's a key piece that we've talked about quite a bit. This is based on data and analytics. They don't lie. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, they've also offered us guidance on how AED, again, as an organization can best be structured, organized, and funded long-term for success. Um, we had two key consulting firm partners who are going to be with us today virtually. First, and I'm going to introduce them now, and then I get to hand over the virtual reins uh, as, as far as this goes. First, Dr. Ioana Morfessis. As the president of IO Inc., she has focused her professional life on helping communities and companies thrive and succeed. It, it, it was funny, early in the process, someone said to me, well, Danielle, how are you gonna figure out how to bring everybody together as a region? And I said, well, you know, um, we're gonna have to work really hard, but I've also found somebody who can help us who's done it before in multiple regions. So at least that's a, that gives us a pretty good fighting chance, doesn't it? Um, over her career, Dr. Morfessis has founded three best-in-class economic development organizations in the U.S., where her work resulted in 300 successful business locations and expansions, and uh, the attraction of about $30 billion in private capital investment, and the creation of more than 200,000 new direct private sector jobs in those markets. In 2004, she launched IO Inc. Uh, it's a visionary consulting practice, and it works with Fortune 500 companies, young enterprises, nonprofits, colleges and universities, and countries and cities across the US, and world business and economic growth strategies. She's a member of the McKinsey Global Institute's executive panel, the Wall Street Journal's opinion leaders community, and the Hartford's Small Business Council. And she's actually authored and published numerous journal articles and op-eds in regional and national publications. She was elected to the ASU College of Public Programs Hall of Fame, back in 1996. And uh, so uh, we will shortly virtually welcome Dr. Morfessis. And then in addition to Dr. Morfessis is Barry Matherly, uh, also someone who has founded and launched and, and reinvented regional organizations across the US. He is the president of Hickey Global Economic Development Consulting. Barry has helped communities prosper by creating opportunities for new investment and job growth over 25 years. Uh, he's a certified economic development professional, trusted thought leader, I can attest to that, and he develops growth strategies to create a vibrant, inclusive communities that promote sustainability. Mr. Matherly is a past chair of the International Economic Development Council. That is for, uh, for economic development geeks like me, that is our guidepost association and professional training organization. Um, it's, it's really fantastic. It is the largest economic development association in the world. And he's also a member of the United States Department of Commerce Investment Advisory Council. Hickey Global is a full service economic development consulting firm, and it supports public, private, as well as nonprofit economic development organizations 
worldwide. So as you can tell, we have an amazing team leading the charge for us. And now I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful folks running AV in the back, and we're going to welcome our consultants. All right, you guys are on. Thank you very much, Danielle. And thanks to all of you who are here today, both in person and virtually. It's a real honor to have and privilege to have been able to work with the Albuquerque Economic Development and alongside Barry Matherly and Hickey Global. Uh, my job this morning is to quickly review the SWOT analysis that was done. We interviewed just over 80 we connected with and engaged with over 80 uh, stakeholders from the private sector, local, county and state government, nonprofit organizations, educational sector, including the educational institutions, as well as civic leaders. Um, what you see in this summary essentially is a synthesis of the opinions of the people that we engaged with and interviewed. So these represent the opinions and perceptions and concerns of residents, businesses, business owners, executives, uh, nonprofit leaders in the Albuquerque region. Let me just do top line uh, in terms of strengths. Everybody was uh, quick to talk about the natural beauty, the quality of life, the climate, the fact that the cultural and ethnic diversity that is historic is a significant dimension and characteristic of the Albuquerque regional um, fabric. The fact that the community is centrally located in the US and also happens to be in the central time zone a lot of pluses, the federal and military, the federal labs and military installations and the intellectual capital that those facilities um, essentially attract and have on site, the uh, human capital and workforce that is in the Albuquerque region, the higher education institutions themselves, and I won't read them all, absence of natural disasters, um, and that's really mostly about earthquakes uh, because that's very important to manufacturing and high tech companies. And also, obviously, that Albuquerque is open to new ideas, new ways of doing things, and most importantly, to newcomers. Every community in the United States and really around the world has weaknesses. And I'm not going to read these. You can see them for yourselves. But again, these represent the perceptions and concerns of the Albuquerque representatives that we engaged with uh, for stakeholder input. Um, clearly the number one concern, and this cut across every person, every sector, is crime, poverty, and homelessness. And those are issues that many cities are confronted with and uh, really need to be addressed over the long term. There is no quick fix or easy solution. Let's talk about opportunities because obviously these factor into the strategy and the roadmap for Albuquerque's economic development, improving K through 12 education, growing and diversifying the region's economic base. This is mission critical to the entire community, whether you're, you are a city, a county, the state government, private sector, educational official, um, or civic leader. This is absolutely paramount for the Albuquerque region to thrive, prosper, and be sustainable over the long term. Uh, obviously, attracting firms and uh, startups and new enterprises in key economic sectors and Barry Matherly will be going into that in greater detail. Improving the competitiveness and business climate of the greater Albuquerque region. This is a major opportunity, but it's also a critically important must do on the checklist. In terms of threats, 
A lot of those are outside of the control of the local community, but some are within direct control of the local community. Clearly, no community is immune to the vagaries of what happens around the world, whether it's a pandemic, a recession, a downturn, supply chain disruption, whatever the case may be. But there are threats here that were again shared uh, by the stakeholders who engaged in this process. Um, and perhaps one of the ones that was most underscored by so many people was the failure for the region and the region's leaders, public, private, educational, and civic, to adopt a systemic approach to having a streamlined, aligned, focused, and high-performing economic development strategy. So um, obviously there are issues associated with crime, poverty, and homelessness, and the uh, uh, performance of traditional K through 12 schools. So with that, obviously there are phenomenal assets that the region has, be proud of them, continue to make them stronger still, and uh, many opportunities that lie ahead. Working on the checklist of weaknesses and threats is critically important to a successful economic development strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Iwana, and I uh, appreciate uh, you kind of going over that huge list. One of the things when I look at that list and then I think about the discussion uh, that we're having moving forward here is there's a reoccurring theme I think you'll hear here is that especially after the pandemic and all the seismic shifts going on, now is the time, the perfect time for Albuquerque to move up and take advantage of this opportunity. The kind of the standard deck chairs are all being rearranged and those who have a plan, those who have the resources can then act with urgency at this point and position for a long-term future growth. In doing so, we always like to look from a competitive standpoint. Economic development is a competitive profession. It's nice to know where you stand, but it's more important to understand where you lay and where you line up against your competitors. So for this exercise, we actually identified 10 competitors, uh, kind of a normal, a bigger list than normal, uh, but one that we definitely wanted to give uh, some breath to. And what you'll see, um, and this is just some of the examples of, of work that we did, is that the competitors are all mid-sized to larger metropolitan areas, mostly in the kind of the west or midwest of the country here, but all competitors that you've dealt with in the past. Two of the ones that obviously are the biggest uh, on here are Phoenix and the Dallas area. And even though they're much larger than you, they are areas you should be competing with because you can take business with them and intercept business from them. And so those areas were, were looked at by site selectors and agreed upon using data that you had and also data that um, you reached out to outside external councils for. So in addition to this, we did labor analytics, we looked at the occupations, taxes, incentives, we looked at infrastructure, we looked at all the quality of life metrics, and we kind of took all of that and used it as a background to kind of come up with some kind of overall arching thoughts here on um, some of the, the big picture ideas. And so you'll kind of see here on the next slide that when you look at kind of the advantages you have, there are some major takeaways from that research. The big one is your labor force being skilled, highly skilled actually, being affordable and being almost at the total population, that million mark, the workforce is usually about half, is that it is very competitive, very competitive on a national level and very competitive against the competitive set that we set you up in. And so this is something that is going to be key because labor is has been the number one driver and continues to be the number one driver when we're looking at economic development projects, either growing in your community or coming to your community. We also did a lot of work on cluster studies, not just looking at the occupation, but looking at what clusters were most prevalent. And you'll see here the good news is the six clusters we settled on, we'll talk about this a little more later on, all do well nationally. 
Now, there are some caveats to that, and we'll talk about that later. The big thing is, and everyone in this audience knows it, the amount of research and engineering talent concentrated in that area is just phenomenal. It's almost unmatched. Uh, when you look at the amount of R&D that's created per capita, ranks right at the top of the nation. And so there's all this intellectual property, all this brain power in that area, and it's just phenomenal. Building bridges so that we can commercialize that and it goes from not just being a lab, but out to the private sector and with companies is also something that we looked at in this takeaway. And then once again, this is another theme is not only do we look at the region, but it's always from a, a lens of competitiveness. Our other half of our company that I work for, Hikin Associates, is one of the largest site selection firms in the world. And what they do every day is try to help companies on the other side find locations. And so everything that we do on that side is about narrowing down the competition. And so as we look at it from a site selector, we're trying to narrow down to the location. As we look at it from EDO Consulting, we're trying to give this area the best opportunity to attract investment, grow, and keep investment in that area. Three of the ones that rank higher professional corporate services. This is really kind of in that shared office space, the biosciences, and then I think we've all seen it uh, over and over again, the film and media sectors, just announcement after announcement in that area. You know, one had touched on this on some of the kind of downsides really being at some of the lowest high school graduation rates. Once again, this is against the competitor group and bachelors, but unique enough uh, at the doctor and kind of um, the master's level and even in professional certificates uh, right at the top of the list. Um, so this tells us that um, kind of good news and bad news is that trying to grow this uh, top level is not occurring from within totally. Uh, there are some great universities, we've been working with them that are producing some of that talent, but you're also bringing in additional talent to fill that out. Um, but at the same time, there's an effort underway to really kind of make that a, a focus. And, and that's exciting and it's exciting to hear. Of course, some infrastructure just being kind of in the topography of that area. And then, you know, it's funny, we talk a lot about natural disasters and get a lot of opinions on that. The interesting thing is against your competitors, you're really kind of right in the middle. Um, a lot of your competitors have much lower scores on total uh, hazard index. Um, and then some have few. So uh, it's always good to kind of have that national feel and that local feel, but it's also good once I said to know how the competitors are kind of coming out. So that one kind of definitely falls into the um, competitor area. You know one. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, that analysis is probably one of the most thorough and telling analyses that uh, I have seen, and, and Barry and his team did a spectacular job on that. So in all of this data, all of the analytics, the competitive and comparative analyses brought us to, and, and where out the Albuquerque region is today, and where it needs to be tomorrow brought us to a big idea metric and that is in the strategy and that is to rank in the top 25 percent of mid-sized markets in the u.s for job growth within five years now you may say hmm well it is achievable it's somewhat of a stretch goal because nobody knows what's going to happen in the global economy and with a complete upending of of how the, the future of work and how work is structured. This needs to be figured out and it will be revealing itself over time. So having said that, we did look at other big idea metrics, many of which uh, maybe didn't race the motors of the task force or maybe weren't seen as profoundly significant enough, meaning being in the top quartile of job growth for a mid-sized market in the United States of America, the most robust economy in the world, that is a big deal. This big idea metric is a stretch goal and it's a big deal for the Albuquerque region or any mid-sized market. But let me share with you 
that we had others that were ruled out after we did further now Barry and his team did further analysis and maybe wouldn't be as significant five years from now. And so, for example, being home to at least one major division or corporate headquarters, divisional or regional, divisional or corporate headquarters of a Fortune 500 company uh, firm in five years. Well, that's a great goal. Everybody wants to get there. But the behavior of Fortune 500 companies is changing as well. As we know, the nature of work has changed dramatically. None of us can predict what that's going to look like. Being ranked in the top 100 by uh, Forbes magazine, top 100 best places for businesses, uh, for business and careers. That's an important one, but a lot of these rankings are going to fall out of favor. So over time, from the very outset, we did look at multiple potential big idea options. Another one was to create X number of jobs in five years. And again, because of the explosion of remote work and the changing nature of work, it's hard to predict. So we are going, we recommended this being in the top 25% quartile of mid-sized markets in the United States of America for job growth. Again, an ambitious and lofty goal, but one that is clearly achievable with all of the assets that the Albuquerque region has. Yeah, and let me add to that is, as we've mentioned on um, numerous times and Danielle pointed it out, it's all based in data and analysis here. And it's all based on your competitors um, and competing regions across the US. So for the competitor regions, we used a, a small group because that's the day to day. But on this, we wanted to think big. We wanted to think national. And one of the things we realized when we looked at the data is Albuquerque has done well um, compared to its historic uh, performance, uh, especially leading into 2019 it was a very good year. But what we realized is when you took all the mid-sized metros in the US, even with that growth, it still was in the bottom 25%, uh, which is amazing to think about. So once again, just focused locally, it, it feels pretty good and it should because uh, it's internal improvement. But against all the other mid-sized markets, it was in the bottom 25%. So this goal is to move from the bottom quartile to the top quartile in five years. And that is that is a big goal. And especially in these times uh, where it's gonna be very hard to predict how everything shakes out in the next couple of years. But once again, that's why you have the strategy to make it go. In addition to the strategy or built into the strategy, I should say, is also the vision and mission, which people have, but a new thing was added, and these are guiding principles. We feel very strongly about principle-based organizations and how they operate and how they run. It's done a lot in the corporate sector that people kind of have the principles they go by. This is for the team. This is how the team acts. This is how the team approaches decision-making and guides them through the process. So you'll see here it got really put down into four large buckets, each of them being uh, two or three variables in there together. I think the big thing that you'll see here is really a willingness to work with the community through the collaboration, but also I think the fact to really make it an ethical and inclusive is a big, big bucket to put in there. And so you'll see throughout the strategy too that this way we looked at metrics, the way that we looked at data was to try to be very inclusive you know, in this process. And then obviously you see the rest here kind of guiding the team and then down into the vision part. And the vision is also trying to be big here because it's looking at this whole Midwest region and really where the vision should be. And actually the other kind of big counterpart to this is the mission. I'll let Ia want to talk about that. Thank you, Barry. So in terms of the mission, it's right there. Uh, AED leads and executes strategies designed to grow and diversify, underscoring those two uh, verbs. The economic base of the Albuquerque region, creating a prosperous, diverse, and inclusive economy and elevating the standard of living for all. This is very important. And for many people who are here today, this may sound similar to the previous mission, but here's the key difference. AED's mission, and it's a legacy organization, 
has a rich history, highly regarded. Its mission was to attract and grow jobs. In the world of economic development and the global economic development arena, it's more than that. And so this new mission statement expands on that role, but it really talks about why it's being done. It gets back to Barry's point that embedding within everything that we do as economic developers, as community leaders, is the, all the, the principle center precepts that we need to operate by. Why are we doing this? To elevate the standard of living and quality of life for the people we serve. And so this new uh, expanded mission statement doesn't deviate from the importance of growing the economy and diversifying it, but really talks about why it needs to be done and to what end. Thank you. So the targeted cluster is kind of the next huge phase that we spent a lot of time on and a lot of data analytics on this piece. Because this is kind of the targeting exercise. This is focusing resources on areas that we think are in putting you in the place of most potential. And so in this area, what you'll see is six clusters here. And the good thing about this is instead of having to go through a full cluster study, which is it was very involved, we were able to do what we call cluster verification. And that's thanks to the good work that was done before. So we were able to look at publications like the planning districts, uh, comprehensive economic development strategy, referred to as a said strategy. The state economic development has done work on this. We have history and the AED has kept over the years of kind of projects and where they've been. So we actually took a lot of that data and started from scratch, instead of starting from scratch, and really kind of focused in on some. Now we did make changes. Some of the ones that started didn't make it and we made some um, others, but you see the first three here are really based on this strong R&D and this brain trust capability that you have in the region. Aerospace, the biosciences, and the renewable energy, all high-end future occupations and industries. And then you see at the bottom, we're adding some diversity in here, is the digital. You see kind of the digital media and film, uh, corporate and professional services and manufacturing. And I think the big thing here is film, you've seen this. HQ2 is a big thing that, that we had when uh, looking for a big headquarters. Albuquerque is already, I think, almost the HQ. It's the second headquarters and it could be number one one day, but it's huge what's going on there. Creative professional services is another strong set. And then manufacturing is an interesting one. It really kind of provide some balance that we're also looking for. We're trying to balance these clusters too to work on resiliency, also planning. So I think altogether we've got a very good balanced uh, set of six clusters that we're focused on. And then there's subclusters and also these that we also then even go for a deeper focus on this area. Next, we turn our attention to actually making the plan work. And I think this is key, and this is what we've talked about, is it's great to have a lot of research, it's great to have a lot of targeting, uh, but you've got to make it work. And so we really put all of this kind of execution into four big buckets here. The first is diversifying the economy. And you can see there's all kind of in here, but the two I'll just kind of point out right now. One is, and it's we've mentioned it, the urgency of the time, is you've got to capitalize on these national and global trends. On the site selector side we work on, we've been talking to the corporate CEO and C-suite for the last year and a year and a half. We know what they're thinking and what they're thinking is different than a year and a half ago or even two years ago. And so you're in a great potential to take advantage of this. Reshoring, onshoring, all kind of opportunities here based on your position and where you fit into the supply chain in relation to Mexico and other assets in this area. And then the one that transitions this is the site selector outreach. And I know this very well from our sister company, but there are a lot of huge deals and getting Albuquerque higher up in the minds of this group that are charged with moving is very big. Our firm has done a lot of deals in that area, is very high on that area and continue to be, but there's so many more companies like ours that we really need to bring into this goal. And that kind of transitions into the marketing, which I know Iowana is passionate and a specialist on. 
Thank you, Barry. Um, before we continue, we did get a, a comment in the chat room. Apparently, the slides that are being shown to the audience and that Barry, you and I can see are not seeable or visible to the other virtual attendees. FYI, I'm sure it's a uh, technical issue. Um, thank you, Barry. Uh, yes, I am passionate about marketing. It's telling the story. I will say that based on a, uh, a uh, national survey of economic development organizations, shorthand is EDO, um, uh, 29 responding of all sizes, comparably sized organizations comparable to AED have twice the budget. Uh, everybody needs to get out there and tell their story in a very focused and intelligent way. Um, people are going to discover Albuquerque because Albuquerque is top of mind. It's a message that, as Barry said, you have to get in front of site location consultants, CEOs, and others who influence where companies decide to create jobs, grow, or start up. And so the marketing piece is very important and a much larger investment in marketing for the region needs to be made. And we can uh, provide all the uh, data that supports that just based on that one national survey. Thank you. When you look at the third one here on the competitiveness, this is so you're, you're doing the business development work, you're marketing, here you're trying to work on things that are the product, the product that you're selling and the product that you use to attract and retain companies. The one I want to really point out here is not only is it part of talent attraction, but there's a big product development piece I want to mention here. You know, we did a, a separate analysis of the costs of industrial and commercial office in the area. And the good news, and this is a similar theme, is you're lower than the national average. Well, that's great. Um, but compared to your competitive set, you were the second highest. And so in that, in one, you were the second, and one, I think you were the fourth. So you're not going to get an advantage on cost against your competitors. You will on national, but it's really a focused competition. So this is where you get into the spec building programs, to programs where you're developing the land. Not only does it shorten the time frame, but it also takes away risk. And right now, risk is first and foremost in C-suite mines. It went from being a variable we used on the site selector to one of the top five variables we use now on the site selection area. And the more re de risk you can have, the better off you'll be. So by having these sites, each step de-risks the process. And even though your real estate might be a little higher than your competitors, it'll take the process and give you an advantage. So I think that's something key to, to really think about and, and really look at as you move forward there. Thank you, Barry. And to add on to what Barry has just said about regional competitiveness, the greatest asset any community has is its uh, human and intellectual capital. And those are people, human beings, who have their lives and livelihoods in the um, Albuquerque region. Uh, the talent piece cannot be overemphasized. And as much as mitigating risk and minimizing risk because of the upheaval and the world that we all have experienced this past year, um, the uh, nature of work, what people want, what they're willing to do has changed. So as much as Albuquerque shines above all other communities in the United States of America in terms of concentration of PhDs, uh, master's degrees and certificate holders, we have to continuously invest in our talent that starts preschool on through post 16 years, essentially, of education. And um, having a talent development strategy that is aligned with where the greatest opportunities are to support existing uh, labs and businesses, as well as potentially new, is absolutely mission critical to the Albuquerque region's success. Barry? Let me hit one piece here and then I'll come back to you on the this one. 
But I think the key thing too here is structure. Not only do we do a strategic plan, but we looked, you see how to modernize the AED organization. And fortunately, um, Ioan and I have had a lot of practice at creating and restructuring uh, economic development organizations. Um, and so we really had a, a great opportunity to see some of the latest and greatest of what people are doing behind the scenes. And one of the big things is structurally the need to really kind of create a 501c3 that allows money to come in directly to economic development, kind of frees up the spending on that. Um, and that's what a lot of EDOs have even converted to. Um, so that is a, a pure nonprofit uh, and allows you to take in foundation money is the big differentiator. Ioana, I think you had a few things to add there. Right, about the... Um the core mission efforts of um, every economic development organization over time and AED being a legacy organization suffers from mission creep. And um, that's because economic development is all things to all people, even though it shouldn't be. And it's, it's, it's sort of a natural evolution and unfolding of an organization as it matures. It's time now to focus, focus, focus on the core mission of growing and diversifying the economy. It's going to be very important that all of the AED resources are in complete support and alignment with the core mission of the organization, which is to grow and diversify um, the regional economy. There are many partners, and we'll get into that a little bit later, with whom uh, AED can work, public sector, nonprofit, private sector, business and industry and trade groups. And we need to make sure that we're all in alignment of going down this path together toward the, toward the uh, shared goal at the end of this rainbow. Barry? So always on people's mind are incentives and there's a lot of discussion out there uh, on both sides. But in the end, incentives are usually designed to make up some kind of shortcoming. Uh, so it makes you levels the playing field here. One of the things we did as an offset to that is review kind of the current incentives. Uh, mostly these are focused at the state level and also look at the not only incentives, but legislation that was coming and in current and made uh, some recommendations. The key here is really to provide focus on what really matters and really what tips the difference. Incentives do not drive a company to your area. They do not. And we, we at Hickey and Associates on our site selection side will say that. What they do is they make a difference at the margin. Once people are very comfortable with the region, they think they can be successful there, then they're just trying to level the cost structure of all the three, usually two or three competitors. And that's where incentives kind of come in. So I think the big thing here is not only once again, focusing on what incentives you have, but what do your competitors state have? What are they doing? What new policies? And I tell you, this is also a big time of shift because there's a lot of money flowing in from the federal level, the economic development, and each state is deciding how they're gonna use that. Some, not just pure incentives, but infrastructure they're gonna put in, some also into programs. Uh, we heard talent from Iowana. So there's a lot of other things here. It's not just incentives. It's really more a policy point. But the point is to know how they tie into your strategy. What AD needs to focus is on yours, your competitors, and how they work together to drive your mission forward. I think with that, I really kind of want to move into our last section here. And this is hard to believe. We've condensed uh, months and months and months of work to this. Um, but there's a concept of, of not only AED having metrics, but maybe the larger region having metrics. The big thing I wanted to mention here is there's things AED can control and things they don't control. And so it's good to have community-wide metrics, but what AED needs to do is focus and be held accountable for what they control, but they also need to be involved in the product development, at least weighing into it, where others in the community, those sitting in the audience today were more responsible. So I'll let you want to talk about this for a minute and then close it out. The 
thank you, Barry. The regional scorecard is very important. If you log on to just about any metro area in the United States, you will find very similar scorecards. Uh, all of them have, have them, and actually they have been a unifying and alignment tool in many metropolitan areas. So the entire region, the cities, the counties, even state government, buy into the indicators. And these are not indicators that Barry and I made up. These are real indicators that companies, site location consultants, and others who influence the location decision process are most concerned about. Um, we also have the uh, organizational inputs and impacts. So although AED cannot and does not control that regional scorecard, every entity in, in the orbit of the Albuquerque region does in some way contribute to the performance of the regional economy. With respect to AED inputs, monitoring um, these uh, various inputs are important. A lot of these are, are gold standards for measuring performance of regional economic development organizations. And then obviously, the if you look under organizational inputs, um, the uh, working with existing companies brought up over and over in our SWAT interviews, but looking at converting the rate of leads to prospects, that is really important. Uh, and then in looking at the outputs, meaning the impact of the AED organization itself, helping to work with new capital to attract new capital investment into the community, not only jobs created or retained, but the direct revenue impact of projects. So these, uh, this is a very accountable organization and a very accountable, measurable um, economic development strategy. Very. I think the big way to think about this, and I think this is a, a great what Iwana said, is that inputs are the things that the organization controls. The impacts are, if they do those right, this is the effect you have on the community. And then back to the old list was more how you influence others in the community to also take things that this organization doesn't control, but improve the product like around workforce and education so that it can do a better job selling. I think when you take all this together, the big thing that we're looking at is the time is definitely now because we're not guessing on our side. We already know what a lot of corporate CEOs are planning to do. We already know there's plans in place. There's already site selection narrowing going on. And you'll see a huge push of this as we get through the end of this year and into next. And those communities that take advantage of this opportunity are going to really see huge growth. And I think the big thing is if you look at the factors that are favoring mid-size areas are one of the top areas talent is favoring and now companies are favoring because you have all the assets and all the kind of cool things that some of the larger cities have, but you do have this affordable lifestyle, this ease of movement and so many other things going for you that if you just gear it up. If you go for it, this is the time and this will be kind of that tipping point uh, for the region. I don't know if you had anything to add, Iwana, but uh, it's been a, a long couple months, but uh, great strategy. Well, it's it has been great working with you, Barry, and your team, superb work, and obviously with uh, Danielle, the board, uh, the uh, task force. There is so much to be proud of, and there is so much to work with in the Albuquerque region and feel good about the community there's still a lot of important and vigorous work to be done. And Albuquerque is going to be successful in this enterprise. There's no doubt in our minds. I think you would agree there. Thank you both very much. If everybody can give them a little virtual and an in-person round of applause. <laughs> And they're both right. How's about taking six months of work and, and slide decks of hundreds of data points and crunching it all down to a 30 minute presentation? Uh, I didn't think it was possible there. Uh, they're very good at being succinct, but I think still getting the point across. And, uh, and, and they're also very right. I, I have every 
every belief that we're going to be successful, but also that this is just the start of the work ahead. So, uh, so we've got a, got a long road to haul. Thank you both again for the work you've done to help us create this actionable, data-driven, di again, strategic plan that is going to drive results and accountability. So now we're going to move back into a live portion of the program. It's my pleasure. I get to invite some key partners. So don't just take this from Joe and myself and, and, uh, and very accomplished consultants. We want to hear from some other folks that were very involved in guiding this process as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce and then welcome Karen. Caroline Garcia to the stage as moderator for this conversation. Um, she's just such a tremendous supporter, but she's also an audit partner in the KPMG Energy, Natural Resources, and Chemicals Practice. She has more than 21 years of experience providing financial statement audits, audits of internal control systems, and audits of employee benefit plans. So uh, she's a member of the firm's Global Audit Quality Monitoring Group, National Energy Team. She's a national instructor in KPMG's continuing professional education program and is the partner in charge of the Power and Utilities Learning and Development course for, our, for their KPMG U.S. associates. Um, I could go on and on, but with that, she's, a, a, again, as I mentioned, a strong supporter within the AED organization. She also serves on our executive committee as well as our audit and budget committee for obvious reasons. Uh, and she's going to bring up today's panel. Caroline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, you know, when we started this journey a few months ago, all it took was spending a few minutes with Danielle and her team and the strategic plan advisors to know that I wanted to be a part of this and in a really big way. I was sold and I was ready to offer not only my personal support, but uh, KPMG support as well. Danielle choosing to lead us um, was a huge win for AED, for Albuquerque and for New Mexico. I encourage everyone to spend just a few minutes speaking with her. I promise you it will not be a waste of your time. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to um, ask Tim, um, Tim Nitty, he's an economic development and growth strategy director at uh, PNM. Uh, Roberta Cooper Ramo, who needs no introduction, she's amazing. She's an attorney at law with Madro Sperling and is also a past board chair at AED. And then finally, Samantha Singel, uh, who's vice president for advancement and enrollment strategy at Central New Mexico Community College. So please join us. away for a moment there. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's start off with Tim. So Tim, what about the process that was used to arrive at this plan should give us confidence that it's actually going to work and be impactful? Thanks, Carolyn. Is, let's see, is this on? I can't tell. On? Great. Um, it, you know, it's interesting. I thought a lot about that um, question uh, as part of this process sort of a quality control check all the way throughout. Are we doing the right thing? Are we making the right choices as a group? Um, I was fortunate to spend 20 years advising companies, leading a location selection um, consulting practice all over the world on how to choose locations. And, uh, and as part of that, when you go to communities, generally by the time you get feet on the ground with your team, you know that community better than they know themselves. Uh, it's a very data-driven process. Um, it's very objective. It's all based on knowing facts, not aspirations and conjecture. And, and often as part of that process, these communities will present their strategic plan. And, and a couple of things jump out is first, it, it, some easy ones you think everybody gets right. You have to have the right subject matter experts. And, and a lot of places get that right. Um, a lot don't. Surprisingly, large numbers don't. They get people who really don't know the subject matter, advising them. And clearly we, uh, we avoided that pitfall right from the start. I know Iowana and Barry well. Um, we, we've been in the same industry for a lot of years and they, they truly are great experts. They have their fingers on the pulse of what's happening and they really understand what they're doing. Um, next thing that a lot of places don't do that we got right is it was inclusive. We had the right people who know this region inside and out, who live here, who've lived here a lot longer than I have in a lot of instances, 
um, really giving them the benefit of local experience, which is hard to get out of the data in a six month period. They've done a tremendous amount of work very quickly and having that kind of input was great. Um, a lot of places don't do that. Uh, in this case, again, really great process of being inclusive and the amount of folks they talk to. And I, in my four or five years here now, um, know this community pretty well. They had the right people they were listening to. What's really interesting, what almost no places get right, is, is as I said, when you get feet on the ground as a consultant helping a major corporation choose a location, you know that location inside and out. Um, you have to. And often when the community starts presenting their strategic plan to you to show you how forward looking they are, and they start presenting who they believe they are, it often bears almost no resemblance to reality. When they put forward their strengths, what they're projecting as who they are today is purely aspirational, and often could never happen in a 20 year time frame. They couldn't re-engineer themselves to be what they're presenting. And when they start talking about their challenges, um, often that again, bears almost no resemblance to reality. And one thing that's always important is to realize is every community has challenges and strengths and we're no different. This group was 100% objective about who we are today, what our strengths are, what our challenges are, and really was committed to coming up with a plan that was based on reality. It wasn't based on what we thought we wanted to be. Um, what we think we wanna be is what the plan gets us to be. And, and it's, not, it's not starting out saying, okay, we're waving a magic wand and what we wanna be in five years, we're just that. So let's plan around being that. This plan gets us there. And that's the final part that I'd like to emphasize is a lot of these plans that get created, um, it, the end product is the plan itself and the document. This wasn't about a document. This was about coming up with actionable, real tactical advice on how to get the strategy implemented. And that's the place where usually these plans fall apart. They, they fall apart in a couple of ways. One is they don't have a plan. And when somebody presents you the, these, these roadmaps for their future, they're asking you to invest in by helping your client to go there. Um, when you ask the question, great, this sounds tremendous. What's, what's the steps to getting there? It's, it's crickets chirping. There is no tactical method of implementing. Or their plans are so far reaching, and I think Iowana pointed this out, um, you know, it, they're talking about doing things that economic development could never be in control of fixing. They'll tell you, we're going to turn around our K through 12 education system, we're going to solve crime. And you look at a, a, what's basically a regional marketing organization to attract business, and, and that's their plan, is to completely renovate the society as they know it. And that's simply unrealistic. So those are all things that I've constantly seen over 20 years advising companies where communities just completely get it wrong. And uh, in this case, um, we had a team driving this that knew from the start that those were the things to avoid. So th that, that's why I you know, thought it was so critical to, to support this effort and to be involved is it started out from, the, from day one, avoiding all those common pitfalls. Yeah, such great insight. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Samantha or Roberta, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, Samantha has two bottles of water, so she goes to <laughs> <laughs> I only got one. <laughs> Well, thanks. Um, you know, it, listening to Tim talk, it's, it, it is actually a validation of a community that understands um, ourselves and understands the incredible attributes that we bring to the table. But it also presented for us an opportunity to reflect in a way that often we are too busy and too uh, focused on what's in front of us um, and where we're going to remember that we need to reflect on our opportunities. And so the process really did create an open door of you know, more than 80 folks participating and, and contributing to this information. And, and I valued that I got to hear and understand all of those different perspectives and, and how they can influence the work we do as we move forward as a, as a community together, as a collective community together. All right, so Samantha, I have a question for you. So um, when we implement this and it starts to produce real results, how do you think the region looks different than it does now? Well, I really like this question. So um, I appreciate, thank you for asking me. And it, I don't know that it's all about how we look. 
Um, I've been thinking a lot about when I read this page that talks about our SWOT analysis and how we talked about ourselves. And, and when I listened to Tim talk about how we are very realistic about who we are and what we can do, I think about what not only how do we look, but how do we sound and how do we act um, as a result of this plan? You know, many times when I reflect on how we describe ourselves, we, um, and Danielle and I talked about this, like we describe the sunshine as being one of our greatest attributes, but we have so many more incredible attributes as a community. And, and in when this plan comes to fruition and as we see the outcome and the results, It'll be how we talk about ourselves, how Albuquerque and Central New Mexico, we individually describe our community and the assets that we have, and that we truly understand those assets to be able to um, attract new and opportunities into New Mexico, but also to um, grow those that are here today. So, you know, truly believe in ourselves in a way that we understand we have a skilled workforce. We have um, so many other attributes and in, uh, in from so many different sectors to contribute to that. But it's also how we act um, as a community, as a central New Mexico community coming together to truly become a systemic approach to change, to truly create systems of um, action, systems of um, um, reaction to what we know, whether or not we're competitive in any, any work we do. We have many pieces and many elements of this today, but as we think about the future and this, this plan really coming to fruition, it will create an opportunity for all of us to act in these systems so that when we have an opportunity presented to us, we are bringing all of the greatest good to the table to be able to be competitive. I'll use an example. Um, from our from the sector in which I work within, um, you know, higher education uh, ha is built to create a skilled workforce to give us that competitive advantage. And for instance, at Central New Mexico Community College, under the leadership of President Hartzler, we're really thinking about how we are creating education and opportunity and training that is not only gives access to New Mexicans to be competitive in that workforce, but gives us the opportunity to align, to be responsive, to be agile, and to provide those opportunities for businesses to be competitive in New Mexico. Our workforce opportunities are, are immense as a result of systems aligning to a plan like this. So pick a sector. We have this opportunity to align and it's how we will act that will really make a difference. So Roberta, um, you are incredibly selfless with your time and your energy to AED over the years. We're grateful to have you. Um, uh, what is unique about the development of this plan? Uh, let me say that um, I think we overuse the word unique sometimes, but the fact is that hard as it was to listen to some of the things we learned about ourselves that we all know but don't want to talk about, uh, it was enormously important that several things happened. We got people from outside New Mexico to look at us. And that's important because we're trying to get people from outside here. So we had our own views, of course, about how we look to everybody else. But in fact, it took the insights of people from outside, our experts, to help us see the reality of it. And I'll give you one example. Like everybody else who grew up here, and I go around the world and say I'm one of six people that grew up in Albuquerque. In fact, 10 of you are here. Um, I always say we have such perfect weather in every possible way. We have the four seasons, the mountain air. We're a completely fabulous place to live from a weather and natural disaster point of view. And it turns out we're kind of in the middle of people uh, that we compete with. And I, in fact, everybody on the task force will remember, I kept saying, well, that can't be right. <laughs> But in fact, when they looked at the cities we compete with, indeed, we do have all those good things, but it's not our leading quality. Well, that was hard for me to hear since I've gone all around telling people that's why they should come here. But in fact, it's that kind of data-driven analysis that made an enormous difference in how we came up with a plan. And so one of the things that is very different about this is that in fact, it's based on data. That's very important. 
The second thing I want to talk about that I think was really important is in the last statement of the, uh, of the mission statement of AED. I don't have to tell anybody in this room how poor we are as a state and how poor we are. Uh, and poverty is just a, an enormous problem in a gorgeous place. We have too many people who suffer every day from uh, poverty in all kinds of ways. And we've really seen it during the pandemic. But look at the last line of the mission statement, because I want to read it. It says, what we're trying to do is to grow and diversify the economic base and elevate the standard of living for all. The ultimate way to get rid of poverty and poverty of expectations is by making sure that everyone has an opportunity that includes the abilities to have a good job. And that's really at the bottom line, what we're trying to do here. And so linking our work in Albuquerque economic development to changing the lives of all of the people that live in our area is an enormously important thing to recognize. And the fact that this plan says that reminds us all of our responsibility as citizens. The other thing I wanna say is that I think part of what happens here is uh, another change. And I give Danielle and Awe and Joe and Cynthia, all of the uh, leaders of our organization and Eric for bringing uh, Danielle here and for leading us through the pandemic. We suffer here from um, not feeling that we deserve the best. It's the greatest weakness, I think, of our culture. And I want to talk in a second about what I think is good. But to even have the audacity to say that our goal is to rank in the top 25% in five years of anything, that's a change of mind and mindset that is enormously important for us. And the fact that we're putting it out there so that in five years, if we fail, everybody's going to know we failed, that takes a lot of courage too. So I am extremely impressed at the courage of all of the people on our board who were involved in agreeing that we deserve to be in the top 25% of something and then to committing ourselves to actually make that happen. So we're gonna know in five years what kind of organization we are and what kind of regional community we are because if we're not there, I'm gonna be really upset. And you don't ask my children, you don't wanna be around me when I'm really upset. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is something uh, that maybe is only slightly related. Um, I think one of the things this does is it points out that we're all sitting here not just representing our businesses and not just wanting business opportunities, but we're all citizens of the community. AED can't fix the crime problem, the homelessness problem, or the educational problem. We are aware of it, we understand the impact of it, but that's not our mission. But every person sitting in this room and every person watching on Zoom, we're all citizens of this place. And our responsibility as citizens is to demand and help support the leaders that are gonna fix those problems. And I think we have to emphasize again, our personal responsibility for being citizens. And part of the reason I so want to be sure that we do this and that this works is because there is something unique about Albuquerque, the metro area and New Mexico. And it's not our weather and it's not the exquisite nature that we have outside that we had nothing to do with, but a lot to do to save and make sure we take care of. What it has to do with is our culture. I have explained to many people as I've gone around the world in my life, being lucky enough to talk to people from different places who have no idea where Albuquerque or New Mexico is, that what is different about New Mexico is that we don't tolerate difference. I hate that word. We celebrate the differences in one another. We love and admire the diverse cultures. We love and admire diverse religious views. 
And I worry that that's being eroded slightly. And I want to make sure that part of what we do as citizens and as an organization is to make sure that as much as we change the things that need to be changed, that we protect that very important cultural integrity that we have in which we look at people who don't look like us and who don't worship the way we worship and who have different cultural backgrounds that we do. And we say, tell us all about yourselves because you are beautiful to us and our community together is beautiful because we appreciate one another. Roberta, so thank you for that. There's there's one question that is really important that I am asked today. I, we only have 30 minutes. So I'm gonna go to the to the last question that we could rewind if we have some more time, but, and you touched on this, Roberta. Um, you know, we how can others um, help to make the plan successful? It's uh, Samantha or, or Tim. Well, I love jumping in on this question because I think we, every one of us, no matter what sector we come from within this community, have an opportunity to look at this plan and understand how we're gonna be measuring ourselves for success and come from our own place within this community and begin to design and act as um, in a way that creates a, a systematic approach that we together can align to these outcomes. You know, having a measure of being in the top 25% in job growth, every one of us has a role in that. We can all find our place in how that measure can change, but it is absolutely our individual responsibilities to show up in a way that, uh, that means that we're engaged to those outcomes, that we can understand our way to create that impact, that we can contribute in the discussions and that we can hold each other accountable, that we're gonna invite each other to the table for a unified approach for a collective way, um, effort to become more competitive, more com attractive, and to be the place where jobs grew faster than any other community in, 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 in the region or even in the United States. And I think uh, th there's, a, there's a, an interesting dynamic here that I think we can capitalize here in, the, in this area that a lot of places we would compete against could never hope to take advantage of. Um, a lot of times we look at our scale, our size as being a challenge. And in some cases it can be, um, less resources, fewer people. Th those are probably valid concerns though I think we overstate them often. Um, our smallness, our, our scale can be a real advantage when trying to implement a plan like this. I, I spent most of my career in places like New York, DC, London, um, these are very hard places to get the leaders of a community, a business community, a social community together and get them all on the same page. It's almost impossible. Um, we can do that. And it, it struck me from the first day I got here, um, you can rally people together, get them informed, get their ear, um, sometimes get their checkbook, but more importantly, get their support and, and get them rally behind a cause. And one thing we have an opportunity to capitalize on here is get this plan out there, get everybody familiar with what it is. Um, if people have questions, hard questions, easy questions, get them answered, get everybody on the same page, singing from the, the same hymn book to use an old uh, metaphor. Um, and, and it will help us, I think, get around one of the biggest long-term challenges to a plan like this, because it has to be a long-term plan is what I think of as economic development attention deficit disorder. Um, <laughs> you, you set out a plan and for six months, you're going down that road and then something happens, uh, an election, a, a change in the economy. And suddenly, instead of saying, how do we adjust? We scrap the plan and start fresh from new because somebody has the ability to say, we're gonna change the plan um, and nobody questions it. I, I think, the business community, the private sector in this region can be the safety net to making sure that doesn't happen. We need a group of people who are all committed to this plan who say, we've bought into it, we've signed up for it. This is five, 10 years of activity that's gonna resonate over time. Um, every time somebody tries to veer this plan off the rails, there needs to be hard questions asked. Is it reasonable? Are we adjusting cleverly? 
or are we simply on somebody's whim agreeing just not to fight it? We're going to take the path of least resistance. We're not going to all stand up and say, no, we have a plan in place. Before we change that plan, it's got to be something that convinces us all there's a real reason to change it. And it's not just because we don't feel like fighting for it. And I think that's the biggest threat to plans like these is, and I said earlier, I haven't seen that many good ones developed. This is a good one. It was developed correctly. It's the right plan. We've got to be willing to say we're behind it. And if anybody's going to try and change it, you've got to change our minds that it has to be changed. And I think if you see a radical change coming, that's probably a warning signal. If you say somebody, if you hear somebody saying the economy's done this, or this has happened in the environment, um, the ecosystem, okay, we've got to tweak the plan. That's probably worth considering. But the next time somebody says, no, we've got a new plan or a different plan, hard questions have to be asked. So I'll answer easily. I'll tell you what we have to do to make this happen, money. Uh, I think, is it right that we're about a million dollars under what we need to actually, that's a million dollars to AED in order to uh, hire the staff that we need, get the programs that we need, spend the money that we need. And so one of the things that has to happen is that all of us in the business community and uh, those of you in the public sector who are able to support us, we need more money. And if we don't have more staff, and if we don't uh, can't afford to buy the software that we need and the data analytic tools that we need, we can't get this done. So part of what has to happen is we need money. I think the second thing is uh, we have to, there's an election coming up. Uh, New Mexico is a place where we all know uh, everybody in public life. Um, Everett Dirksen once said, uh, some of you are old enough to know who that is. He was a speaker of the house many years ago. He said, if you want a bachelor's degree in politics, you go to Mississippi. If you want a master's degree, you go to Springfield, Illinois, but if you want a PhD, you better go to Santa Fe. And the fact of the matter is that both, uh, on the local and the state level, and we need to push our congressional delegation, we need to make sure that they are supporting economic development friendly policies and they're putting up the money that's necessary to make them happen. All right, so we heard um, Barry and Iwana talk about regionalism. Um, can we, and any one of you, can you speak to what that means to you and why it's important? Oh, um, just briefly, you know, we are a region and we can't afford to compete against ourselves. Um, you know, we're a metropolitan area. We have the, the good fortune that we're not so congested and spread out that we can't operate like a region and we need to sell that region. And I think we do a good job of presenting data as a region. What we need to do is not be competing against each other. Um, I've seen this in other places and it takes a leap of faith to make that happen. Um, we've all been frank, we're having this discussion because we're not happy with the progress that's been made in economic development over the years. We're not where we think we ought to be. Um, I believe we could be so much more. Because of that, it's too easy to get into a fight over scraps. We don't have enough opportunities. Everybody fights for the same opportunities and that's understandable. What's ironic is that if we all take this leap of faith and act as a region and compete as a region against the places we compete with, there will be more projects. There will be more opportunities. It will suddenly be less important to fight over the scraps. Um, and I've seen this happen in places like Raleigh, Durham and Charlotte and Tampa, um, places like New York and San Francisco, where once there's enough food at the table, suddenly it's really easy to be competitive because if you win a project for Rio Rancho, it benefits everyone. And Albuquerque understands that. And when it comes time to fight for the next project, everybody's at that table at the beginning telling the, the prospect, we're here to get you to the region. Where you end up within the region, we'll worry about that at the end when it comes to a land transaction, but none of us care about that right now. And when communities embrace that, when they take that mindset, when they're not so worried about scarcity and somebody else getting the meal they should have gotten, suddenly it solves itself. All right, so are, we're at, I'm sorry, are we good on time? Three more minutes, all right. 
Uh, did you did you want to? Yeah, so I'll I'll just say something about regionalism because I think it uh, sometimes we we forget that the benefits that come from economic development in the whole region, as Tim said, benefit us all. And I'll give you an example. Some people say, oh my gosh, Facebook is a fabulous project, but all the gross receipts tax is going to Los Lunas. It's not helping us at all. Wrong. Okay. Look at the contractors that are out there. Look at the solar panels and where they're being built. All we had, I think at one point, a thousand union electricians out there. They don't live in Las Lunas. They live in Albuquerque. I'll give you a personal example. Many of you know that for many years, uh, I ran in addition to practicing law, one of my partners here, so I need to say in addition to practicing law, our family's Western wear business. And there were years when, thank God for Intel. Okay, we didn't have a store in Rio Rancho. We had stores in Albuquerque. And the workwear that came from the Rio Rancho business was enormously important. It kept us alive some years, uh, especially when a certain country Western singer stopped touring, which just I thought was going to kill us. But fortunately, Intel saved us. And I, I think that we have to look at that as a whole. So all of us benefit when the region succeeds. And all of us will benefit in every way. And the other way that we're gonna benefit is intellectual capital. Because one of the things we need here is more intellectual capital. And when intellectual capital works in Rio Rancho, wherever they live, they help us. When intellectual capital comes to Las Lunas or Santa Fe or Bernalillo, it all helps us. And that's what we have to look at. Our investment, in the region is an investment in ourselves. All right. Um, we made it even to one bonus question, so thank you. <laughs> All right. Wow. What an amazing panel. Um, I, we didn't, I mean, none of them are getting paid for any of this. In fact, they're paying us more. <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, talk about a hybrid event today for sure. We are now honored to have one more special guest join us. And we're going back to our little virtual setting. Um, the, the mechanics that the folks in the back are, are doing is just impressing the heck out of me. Um, our special guest is gonna join us to talk about the overall competitive landscape in the US and beyond and, and really help us connect Connect the dots between our strategy and widen our perspectives as we embark upon the implementation journey for this strategy. Uh, Dennis Shea, so I'm also uh, I'm also playing clicker today. Let me make sure I get this going. I may ask Elena to see. Oh, there we go. I'm just a little fast. Sorry. All right, all right, my one clicker mistake today. All right, uh, so Dennis Shea is with us. Dennis is uh, president and publisher of Halcyon Business Publications, and this is since 1986. Um, for those of you that don't know about it, it was founded in 1965, and the company today specializes in economic development media, including publishing. Uh, this is Area Development Magazine, if any of you have heard of this. It's a suite of online media um, associated with it, Area development.com. If you haven't checked it out, I'd encourage you to, to do so. Um, it's an, it's a organizing, they organize more than 75 best practices conference events uh, and video workshops under the consultants forum umbrella. And this is all open to economic developers and, uh, and consultants as well as corporate leaders around the country. Uh, Dennis is also a co-founder and managing director of Fast Facility LLC. They also deliver fastfacility.com. It's a free app access searchable building and sites database and also fast GIS, which uh, as the name implies, a, a custom built GIS database ap application for economic development agencies and corporate entities alike. He has been a featured speaker at, I, I can't tell you, um, numerous professional economic development conferences. I've learned a lot from him over my career um, throughout North America, Europe, and Asia. And he maintains affiliations with a number of economic development associations in the US, Mexico and Canada. So welcome, Dennis. It's a thrill to have you with us today. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I appreciate that uh, lead up. I, I don't know who that guy is, but uh, I like him. Um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here.
Can you hear me? We can. All right. So we're ready. Feel free to go ahead and walk us through some of your comments and uh, I'll follow along with you on your slides. Okay, great. Um, uh, before I begin, uh, first, I want to congratulate uh, uh, your region for, for the announcement from NBC Universal. Uh, we just saw it come across the tape and we're actually posting it today, I believe. But that's another testimony to uh, Albuquerque's attractiveness uh, to uh, pro uh, production and post-production industries and uh, making your, your region a, a growing national center for this type, type of investment. So congratulations on that. Um, listening to today's presentations, I'd like to share results uh, to our annual corporate and site consultant surveys, which I think will fit in well to the message that has uh, been carried through the uh, whole morning. And uh, to give you an idea of what the, uh, the world looks, looks at when they're looking at a location like Albuquerque, now we've been conducting this survey for over 35 years and it's become a bit of a staple. We're very proud of it. It gets picked up by national media. It gets uh, uh, stolen by a lot of other consultancies who wanna use our, de <laughs> our, our result, but we're happy that they're doing it. And uh, to give you some quick background, each survey, both the consultants and the corporate survey go side by side. Uh, these are only a couple of the tables that we have in that you can go online and look at the full report. Uh, we do quite a bit of uh, analytics on, on the results. But just to give you an idea on the corporate side, uh, the respondents are those who are pretty much influencing the decision for a company to, to uh, uh, if we could just go back to that other, the, uh, other screen, please, with the, uh, re there you go, right there. But I'll give you an idea of who's responding to this. And most of them are in a position of, of either influencing or making a decision for the company. So this is on the corporate side. The middle one shows you the type of companies that responded. So going back 35 years, manufacturing, warehouse distribution dominated the responses, but it's growing and spreading as we get into other areas, which are non-manufacturing, uh, much of which uh, benefit many areas now. And then um, uh, if you look at the uh, far side, something of a bit of good news, I jump a little bit into the results. And as you can see, if you go down to the Southwest, Arizona, Nevada, um, to, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, and that area, uh, have done very well. And um, so have uh, some of the other parts of the country. Uh, but you can see what, what areas, for instance, the Plain states are lagging, at least in this year's survey. And um, it gives you an idea of what, what um, where and what the companies are thinking about. Now, if we could jump into the next uh, screen, please. This is, the, uh, this is the consultant survey. We'll take a look at that first. This we did for the last 17 years as a companion survey to the 35-year-old corporate survey. And if we could slide over to the top 10, well, actually we go well down the list, but if you want to take a look at the top 10, uh, what are consultants are considering right now to be the most, uh, uh, driving factors when they're taking a look at a locality and uh, what are the considerations they're taking in, taking into account. Labor costs, no surprise uh, in today's marketplace. Availability of skilled labor, number two. Again, another driver. Uh, highway accessibility, and this has always been in the top, uh, top three of our surveys for probably the last 20 years. So the ability to get products to and from market is very, very important. Energy availability, are you competitive? Do you have an abundance of, uh, you, of uh, utility uh, uh, available? Uh, now with alternative uh, energy, that's gonna be another consideration. Um, and then you go into some of the financial, state and local incentives, right up there when, when a consultant is looking to make a deal, tax considerations, and then we go down. Proximity to suppliers, uh, proximity to major markets, and available uh, land. Um, the, uh, excuse me, I, I'm in a hotel room, so I don't know why they're calling. Um, we'll have to put up with that. Um, the, uh, so you can see the top, re, the top drivers when a consultant's taking a look at it, keep in one mind, consultants are working in, in the, uh, the, uh, event, uh, in, in, uh, in the immediate, if you will, they got a project, they got a client, they got to get it done. They're probably given six to eight months to get a decision taken. So these, these type of things are the drivers that are going to get that deal done. Um, let's go to the, the next, the other survey, the corporate survey. 
And now this is a 35 year old uh, survey. And you can take a look at some of the numbers. They move a little bit, but look at this. Availability of skilled labor is one. Highway accessibility is two. Energy is three. Uh, quality of life uh, is another one that's right up at the top. Labor cost, occupancy and construction cost, corporate tax rate, et cetera. The, the positioning changes, but keep in mind, corporations are looking at something in a different time frame. It may be immediate or it may be a two to three year outlook. So things change a little bit with their considerations as opposed to uh, the consultants who are really much in the moment, if you will. And uh, I think you need to look at this from what you're talking about at, uh, at your conference, how Albuquerque and the region stacks up against that as well as the state. You have a lot of competitors out there. And uh, regionally, uh, between Colorado, Nevada, uh, Arizona, Texas, you're surrounded by very stiff competition. And one of the things, you know, to be part of the, uh, to be in a fight is to at least have something that you can offer that puts your, your, your jurisdiction into the mix. And uh, it's a highly competitive market. And uh, these are some of the considerations that we find last year in 2020. I will say this, as a COVID year, we're trying to figure out if anything was really affected by uh, what has been happening over the last uh, 16 to 18 months. And I, I would say there's some uh, uh, effect on this. I don't, we didn't see a, a, a large effect year over year, but um, pretty much the top 10 stayed the top 10. And uh, so measure yourself against both of these and see how you stack up uh, when you're making your presentation to a, pro to a prospect. Um, if we can go on, uh, a couple other things. Um, the, there was a few, few points that uh, I was asked to take a look at, and I, I'd like to just address them as best I could. Um, the, what we're finding today, and I, I just, we, we do our consultant forum uh, conferences. In fact, I'm in Richmond today. We were in Richmond last week, and Barry Madley will probably uh, it knows what I'm talking about. Uh, we had about 120 economic developers here in Richmond, uh, and they were being uh, uh, treated to the insights of, uh, we had about 14 major consultants, site consultants on the, on the program. And three things came up that I think uh, are important uh, to what you're talking about today, as they are to most economic developers in today's uh, very competitive market. Um, the competition has become, I think, more and more fierce over the last four to five years. Much more competitive uh, between states and jurisdictions. And um, the, the regionalism has become very, very uh, competitive. If you look around you, you can see that most, most economic development agencies now have gone into this regionalism as opposed to a lot of smaller entities uh, trying to survive themselves. So what that has done is, is put a, a lot more strength and muscle behind some of these regions. And we can take a look, look at a place like Charlotte or San Antonio, Austin, um, and go on and on. DFW has been a long-term uh, regional uh, uh, market. And this is, you know, rather than look at the individual communities and jurisdictions, you take a look at the whole. And, and, and I think that makes it a, a, a better advantage to not only the economic developers, but to the, to the uh, companies that are looking at a, a locality. You get to see the bigger picture and see how that will affect their operation when it comes to key uh, elements like uh, 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 quality, uh, quality of life or uh, available uh, employment, uh, demographics, et cetera, as opposed to looking at a lot of small pieces. So one of the things that, uh, that Albuquerque has done and, and, and should continue to do is build their regionalism, uh, get their, get their regionalism, uh, region information together and concise because you're competing with so many other areas. And uh, I take a look, I, I would take a look at an area like Reno, Nevada. I mean, they gave Reno uh, up for dead not so long ago, you know, as the divorce capital of the world. And right now, Reno is just, you know, knocking it out of the park. And you got other areas that uh, uh, similarly, Greater Phoenix, uh, GPEC has made itself into a powerhouse and, and consolidated all these small communities like Goodyear, Peoria, uh, Surprise, et cetera, into this large regional uh, uh, powerhouse. And 
it's really been successful, as we all know, and, and they're continuing to have success. Um, and you can look at other areas like Tulsa now. Tulsa making a major uh, uh, announcement the other day uh, with uh, Canoe uh, in the automotive, uh, EV automotive sector. So marketplaces can, can, can build themselves out, uh, jurisdictions can build themselves out, regions can build themselves out. If you have a game plan and a strategy, and the one thing I think that I hear, and again, I'm, I'm an observer, I'm not a practitioner, but the one thing I keep hearing at our conferences is you got to know who you are and know what your strengths are and what you can offer and what you can pursue. Um, too many times areas, you know, politicians in particular are notorious for this. You know, they're, they're, they're always, uh, why didn't we get this plan? Why didn't we get that plan? Why didn't we get the, the next semiconductor or, or automotive platform? Um, you know, when their market couldn't support it, I'd rather know what their strengths are. They, 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 you know, they go for the home runs and all they do is make a long out. Um, so you need to know who you are, where you might go. And you might not be there now, but you're moving in the right direction. And I think just these announcements that you have had with Netflix and uh, the current one with uh, NBCU, et cetera, you're starting to establish your, 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 your identity in this particular market. It doesn't have to be solely that, but you're starting to make progress. Uh, you have a lot of issues I understand that you need to address, and some of those I think you'll have solutions for. Uh, and again, you have to know who you are, where you are, and what you can support and what you can attract, and then go after it with a vengeance. Um, you, need to, you need to have the talent. The talent is it. And uh, the cover of this magazine, I'll hold it up. This was the issue in which you won the award, but that was our headline. Where's the talent? And obviously, this has been at the, at the top of... Uh, uh, the post-COVID market, particularly when we're faced with, you know, 6 million uh, uh, unemployed and 8 million jobs needing to be filled. There's something wrong with this picture. And uh, talent is going to be it. And um, you need to be able to support. You need that first before you're going to be able to attract anything. Can I fill the jobs if I move to your market? Once that gets established, then you have everything else behind it. Do you have government support? Do you have a quality of life that you can offer? Do you have all the other things that that company needs? But if they don't have the employees, you're not going to be in a, not going to be in a race. Um, so I think these are two things, uh, the competition, the talent. And I think finally, uh, you need to have the programs and initiatives in place, uh, both state and locally. Uh, obviously, for better or for worse in this country, we're very, you know, we have 50 competitive markets. And uh, Canadians look at it and say, I can't understand this, uh, but that's, that's our market and that's what makes us work. So you got, you got 49 other competitors. And uh, as they start to whittle, um, whittle down localities, you're gonna get down to four or five or six, and then it's, then it's a tough go. But you need the programs in place. You need to be able to offer it. It's not a giveaway. If they're sensible, competitive, you'll have a chance to win, win enough, uh, enough projects to have a successful program. But you've, you really need to have that to attract investment in a, in a competitive way. And uh, along with that, all the other things that make economic development as uh, 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 complex and, co uh, and confusing at times, but figure out what, what ABQ has. If you know who you are and what you are, and I'm sure I, I heard this to all the, your, your great speakers prior, um, you're gonna have a very, very good chance of winning. And once you start winning, it, I think it, 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 it'll help you to continue to attract and build out your pro. Uh, can we go to the, uh, the award and I'll give you a, 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 a quick background. Is that, is that okay with you, Danielle? Absolutely. I'd, I'd be thrilled. And I want to let everybody online and in person know, I think this might be the first attempt at receiving an award recognition from somebody in a hotel room in Richmond <laughs> while we're virtual and in person. So absolutely. Who might get thrown out any minute now because, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and, and uh, this is not the Academy Awards. I don't want to pretend it is. But let me just explain what we did. Over the, the, the past years, the 16 years that we've been doing these shovel awards, and it's not a very glamorous name, but I have to say that on a state level in particular, it's, it's something of, uh, we're very pleased uh, with the, the acceptance that it has among the states. Um, 
as a as a uh, as a measurement of a wood. Here's how we do it. It's very simple. We look at the prior year. So this is what happened in 2020, COVID year, very odd year. But when the when uh, when the states start to put all the numbers together, it's usually in January and February that they come out with their their prior year's results in terms of job uh, creation announcements, capex, etc. And we. The only thing that we accept from the states, we give them an opportunity to send us in a uh, representative list of their top projects. And those projects have to be in the ground. In other words, they don't have to be functioning, but rather than just an announcement that may happen or may not happen, it has to have a shovel in the ground. Now, it may mean that it'll come online this year or maybe even the year after, depending on the size of it. But it is a project that has been, it's been approved in his action being taken. So saying that, we, that's how we measure state against state. But we also do it uh, at, on different levels of uh, population. So Rhode Island cannot compete against California. So we have a breakdown by five different state categories. And therefore, the states are sort of competing against themselves by size, by weight. Um, what we did this year, particularly in the case of individual projects, projects of the year, we took a look at all the projects that we received. We break them down in terms of several different things. Um, we want to know the new job creation, the capex, uh, uniqueness. Is it manufacturing, non-manufacturing? The potential impact on the jurisdiction. So uh, that gives small town America a chance to be recognized. And uh, most importantly, uniqueness. Uh, I say that because a few years ago, if you, you scored a million square foot uh, distribution plant from Amazon, that was a big deal. Uh, right now, it's like having Best Buy on every corner. Um, <laughs> one of the things last week, we asked the audience, or one of our speakers did, how many in the room have an Amazon project in their jurisdiction? And I will tell you, nearly every hand went up, and they're from across the country. So we, what we did this year is uh, we almost we were laughing, saying we're going to have the best project that's not Amazon. <laughs> the, um, we actually eliminated a lot of Amazon projects because they're not unique. Uh, they do have an impact on an area. They do employ a lot of people. But what we wanted to do is take a look at, at projects, particularly non-manufacturing. And in this case, Netflix jumped out to us for, for a couple of reasons. One because it was from Albuquerque. We haven't, you know, we're used to hearing from Charlotte and uh, Richmond or Tampa or some of the big markets, Columbus, Ohio, et cetera, large regionals that are scoring projects quite often. But here we are looking at, and we said Netflix. Now maybe this is a COVID hangover because we all watch Netflix until we were <laughs> blind, but uh, it, it struck us as being really unusual. Here's a California based uh, company in the, in the production business. And where are they going? They're going to Albuquerque. When we looked at it closer, we started, we saw what's happening in Albuquerque and it's unique. And you're starting to build a base and, and who knows where this is gonna go. And it's only been underscored by the, uh, the uh, uh, project that you just announced. Um, so this is one of the reasons we chose it. It was a non-manufacturing project. It was in a unique location. New Mexico obviously doesn't compete at the same level with Texas and uh, Nevada and some of the other states in your, in your neighborhood. And uh, for that alone, we thought it was significant and should have a great impact on your local economy. And with that, maybe, you know, be the anchor that keeps it, uh, attracting more and more uh, production and post-production uh, uh, businesses. So there we are. That's where it is. Um, I also will apologize. We, we have all our awards in production, but uh, COVID is the not- The supply chain us. struggle is real, isn't it, Dennis? Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the problem is I, we had hoped to have the award actually physically there, but supply chain has affected them also. And uh, we couldn't get the turnaround that we normally did with the 50 various awards that we had to put together. So uh, saying that, uh, there's the- uh, sidebar that appeared in the magazine um, that uh, spoke about that. You'll find it online as well. And uh, with that, um, we'll be sending out to, to you in New Mexico and in, in, in Albuquerque, uh, the plaque awards that you can display. And hopefully that's just one of a lot that are gonna come down the road uh, each year going forward. So Absolutely. congratulations and thank you very much for allowing me to be on your program. Thank you for being here, Dennis.
All right, so, uh, so for symbolic purposes, uh, here to accept the award in person and grab a quick photo with us um, are representatives that made this all possible. First, uh, John Clark with New Mexico's Economic Development Department, uh, Cynthia Jaramillo with the City of Albuquerque, and then also our own Deborah Inman with AED, who is extremely involved. And while we do this, we have a quick video also from Mayor Keller, who couldn't be here. Um, if we can grab a photo then while we watch this video. For non manufacturing projects of the year for our Netflix project. Albuquerque is excited to be home of Netflix's largest North American production hub. And from the moment Netflix began local operations, they've enjoyed exceptional hospitality from our local vendors and residents. And they found Albuquerque's business environment to be world-class. Their stamp of approval is garnering attention from the film industry, attracting other productions from all around the country, as well as showcasing our creative talent and the residents of our city. Albuquerque is on a path to be one of the largest high-tech and sustainable film production centers on the continent. This award is further testament that we are a highly competitive city that should be on the short list for any site selector looking to relocate or to expand. As Albuquerque enters a period of recovery, we will build upon the success of Netflix to permanently secure our place as a third coast for film, right up there with LA and New York. Our mix of culture and diversity make Albuquerque a place like no other. All right, and, and just some quick comments. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this honor. Uh, I wanna thank the incredibly hardworking and devoted staff at the Economic Development Department, as well as our incredible partners across the state, but particularly today, our partners in Albuquerque Economic Development and the city of Albuquerque. So thank you so much. I would just like to say thank you to everybody. I think it's really important to note though, you know, nobody does this alone. When we really talk about partnerships, I oftentimes think that we don't really understand or acknowledge just the reach that is needed from so many people involved in a process. And it's the city of Albuquerque and it's the state, but it's also people within our community and local businesses that are there at the table, helping us to really sell and help others understand just how incredible this community is the talent that it has, the resources that are there, and the programs that are here to support companies going forward. Thank you. All right, now the part that everybody loves the most about events, the wrap up and the conclusion. So thank you again, everyone. Um, so as we finish up today, you know, so, so now what, right? Are we done? Are we finished? No, we're actually just starting. So we're going to be very busy at AED. We're going to be kicking off efforts over this summer. We're going to be launching industry aligned outreach to get our internal efforts transitioning to a more uh, inclusive regional nonprofit organization. We're going to be having tons of conversations. And again, the work is just beginning. This is, uh, uh, as, uh, as I believe Iwana has said many times, you heard from this is economic development, not economic miracles. So the elbow grease will be in full swing and the work ahead will take time, but we are ready and we are prepared. So uh, Joe, any final comments here? Yes, thank you, Danielle. Um, while our launch of the plan is over, this is kind of the end of the beginning. Um, we're, it's time to put the strategy into action. And to do that, we're gonna need your help. We'll be sending out a follow-up survey asking you about your thoughts on today's program, uh, the strategy and the specific initiatives that you'd like to assist us with. Yes, we're asking for your help. And for those of you that are here in person, if you just hate the digital surveys, we have forms on the table for you to fill out <laughs> where you can indicate which initiatives you'd, you'd be interested in helping out on. Um, just fill those out, drop it in the basket on the way out. And with that, we thank you for attending this presentation. Have a wonderful day and a safe and happy 4th of July. We really appreciate the support of the community in uh, helping us get to this point and furthermore, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you.